Okay. Here we go. Hi. Uh, hi, Mysterium. Uh, my name is Max, and I'm running um, the Finding Tomana panel today, uh, where I am discussing one of my two college theses, which uh, I wrote about MIST this uh, spring semester of 2021, uh, in which I graduated. Um, and before I start, I just want to thank everyone for having me here and the Mysterium uh, organizers to allow me to do this because if you told me at my first Mysterium when I was 15 that I would be presenting at a Mysterium, I would have absolutely lost my mind uh, on my college thesis, no less. So some background for you to start. Um, my general capstone topic was 1990s American literature and culture at Skidmore College. They give you capstone topics and you can work within that topic to find something you like. It's uh, open for the most part with certain stringencies. I couldn't have written about Shakespeare because I signed up for 1990s, uh, vice versa. If you signed up for Shakespeare, you couldn't write about the 1990s. Um, my thesis was written under Dr. Wendy Lee in our English department and reviewed for honors by her and Professor Aaron Peninati, who is in American Studies and Media Film Studies, but he happens to be a gaming studies specialist, and he introduced me to a lot of scholarship on MIST when I was a freshman, and I really thank him for that, and I should have invited him to this, but I didn't, so I'll show him the video afterwards. Uh, my piece was written over the course of a little over three months because that's what the semester was because COVID and it is um, at the end of the panel. It's currently available on Skidmore College's online archive of student scholarship. I know one person has read it since I graduated. So if you're that person, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> um, if not, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, and so the capstone overall is encompassing of uh, what MIST means in a 1990s context. And it was very interesting and kind of difficult for me to write because I was born in the year 2000. And I had a lot of perspectives to juggle that I didn't necessarily know about. And I had to really rely on my professors to make sure that the claims I were making had at least a little bit of truth behind them. And with that, uh, my first section was on attitudes on violence within MIST. Um, as fans, we obviously all know that MIST is not the most violent looter shooter in the world. Um, MIST is uh, calming and a little bit lonely, but in a way that is nice. And when you consider that with the time period, it has some implications that are interesting. And so MIST situates itself uh, post Vietnam and post Desert Storm um, in the early 90s. And those were both events that sparked very strong community uh, feelings and um, sort of just like a divisive attitudes on violence in the American public. And there was conscientious objection in Vietnam and some slightly more complicated feelings during Desert Storm uh, that fueled some other bits of um, racism and complications in America that I don't think is my uh, job to speak on today. Um, so when you consider those two things uh, as being influential to the Mist franchise and um, this simultaneously being released in this 90s golden time with things like Doom and Mortal Kombat that are both not only prevalent in the gaming communities, even still, just like Mist is, but also rely on violence as a uh, tool to move the story forward. You can't necessarily uh, progress in Mortal Kombat without punching a few people, and that's what the game is for. Um, you realize that MIST kind of reflects the nonviolent attitudes of uh, the folks over at Scion and also for the desired 
um, audiences for the game. Um, and I don't think the game was made for people who wanted to play a looter shooter because it, there are looter shooters for that, you know? Um, and um, before Myst, it was really a groundbreaker. And so there wasn't a lot of games that delivered a narrative that was this complex without forcing the players to fight. So you have things like Brick Breaker, for example, which, you know, it's clearly nonviolent. Uh, you're just bouncing a ball around, but there's no uh, plot there. There's no character that you assume. Um, however, in Mist, you assume the stranger and you're immersed into what is a very complex story, a very complex world. And uh, I'll get more into that a little bit later. And you don't have to fight your way through it. You, you're solving, you're thinking, you're reading, and excuse me. These things are all glorified within the world of the game as problem solutions. And then, yeah, I have an extra point here about how popularity among female audiences is also sometimes attributed to its nonviolent qualities by Dr. Celia Pierce, who she does has done a lot of scholarship on Mist. I know for one of her books, she actually interviewed Katie. Uh, and that's how I knew who Katie was when I met her at Real Mysterium a few years ago. So shout out to Celia Pierce for uh, keeping our community alive in scholarship. I utilized uh, two of her different books for this thesis. Next, you have attitudes on new technology. When I was thinking about the 90s, I have to really remember that things now are very different than they were in the 90s. And between, say, the 1960s and the 1990s, there was a lot of growth that was exponential at this unprecedented rate of change. And I, I, I reference in my thesis how my, my dad once told me when I was a teenager that when he was younger, things all came in glass bottles and there was no plastic really being used. And now I'm sitting here talking to you through a black piece of plastic with a camera in it. So when you sit yourself right in the middle in the 1990s there, it's still uh, the beginnings of the internet, the beginnings of digitizing and you know video technology, all of these things are, are just in its starting stages. And a lot of people are afraid of change. But I think that Mist was trying to push the limits and they were trying to encourage users to accept some new technology. And one of the vital points to this is them utilizing the first person in gaming. It's called the subjective point of view to immerse the player. And this point of view is often used in horror. Um, when you're put into the shoes of someone who is, you know, in that hacker slasher and you feel like you're there. Um, however, uh, Mist utilizes it to put autonomy in your hands as the player. And, and you're really assuming that person, the stranger, I suppose. <laughs> um, and as the stranger, you are interacting with this this main kind of new form of technology which is the linking books and the linking books combine a very old technology books which has been around for centuries upon centuries at this point with teleportation which people are familiar with at this time via star trek obviously hyper popular um for decades by the time the 90s comes come, comes around and it doesn't exist, but people, you know, know what it is conceptually. It still doesn't exist. Um, they merge them into this thing that is comfortable and not comfortable for a 1990s user at once. And by forcing game progression to rely on these linking books and not allowing bad things to happen to you to a certain degree, unless you'd like to uh, get trapped uh, with in Atris, not Atris, in um, Cirrus's place or in Akinar's place. It's kind of showing you that using these new things are okay. And it's part of what we need to go forward. I also believe that the linking books can be perceived as a sort of reference or um, 
metaphor for the internet, which was brand new, and uh, hyperlinks uh, in the concept that you click or you touch one thing and you're brought somewhere entirely different. With new tech, they also, they have the linking books, but they rely back on the uh, plain journals and the libraries and the later games. Uh, you have, you know, Gens Journal, yada, yada, um, and you're just reading that. And that, that non-technology brings you comfort and allows you to be comfortable when the new technologies arrive. Attitudes on reading. This was one that uh, really fueled me. And when I was writing, I had this point that I wanted to make and it took me forever to work my way backwards there. And so there is a scholar and a pseudo famous journalist, Mitchell Spelling. He used to write for the LA Times and uh, he currently teaches journalism at uh, NYU at the master's degree level. And in 1991, in the LA Times, he published this article called The Death of Reading, uh, which pretty much claims that due to new technologies such as the television and general other forms of entertainment and communication for people specifically in America, that um, reading books or magazines print was on its deathbed and uh, spelling is very offended about it in this piece um, and it got some pretty decent attention when it first came out and this attitude is definitely still alive to a certain extent uh and you see you know teachers complaining that students don't read enough or or parents and etc but i think that missed very clearly if nothing else uh if they do nothing else in the games um, they're fighting back against this worry that that reading is going to go away by just like giving you book after book after book. And to evidence this, I relied back on the missed novels, which my mom had to bring me when she visited me because I have the missed reader, but I didn't. Um, I didn't bring it because I packed late. So thanks, mom. I know you're downstairs. Um, I talked a lot about how the art is a way to show just how powerful books are. The fact that you can find a way to a completely new place through writing and how it's heavily regulated. Um, and you know there are guilds and etc in the books that all focus on uh, the creation and the writing of these books, and it's that important that uh, you know, it, like in the book of Tiana, um, she's in a lot of trouble because of um, what goes on regarding those books, and it's not to be taken lightly. There's also, of course, like very very helpful. Um, and heavy use of, of book imagery because they are the center of the game. You know, always a library, stained glass with books, pages on the floor. Um, you know, it, it can go on and on throughout the games and that not only ties the games together, but it also brings players together with familiarity with books. You know, you see a book, you gotta read it. And so I think that in general, Mist really did a good job in trying to uh, bolster our support for uh, reading throughout a new age of technology. <sighs> Mist has a huge emphasis on community and community in, in the 90s was um, a very tricky thing because of these new technologies, because of these attitudes on, on violence. It, people really had to uh, rely on their circles and this is the section where I actually did talk about Mysterium in my thesis and how the valuing of community within the stories in the Myst games, in the Myst books, are reflected within the communities that are formed by Myst fans, like here or in um, Uru Online. And these community values that, that were strong, that might not be as strong now or may not have been as strong um, before the 90s, are present both within the Dini as a larger community, uh, as, a, as a society perhaps um, underground, and also within familiar communities where you see conflict or smaller communities 
uh, like, you know, the people of Riven or like the people of Atrus's family, God forbid they get along. <laughs> no, you have to fix it every time. And, and I feel like this emphasis is what caused the bond that people have, which is what brought everyone here today who's, who's watching us and, and kind of inspired their audience to create space for themselves. This was studied in Celia Pierce's other, um, other piece, her other book, Communities of Play, where she did uh, a large study of the Uru diaspora and um, just how committed so many people in this community are to staying together. And, you know, that comes from the game coming out at the right time, reaching the right people and, you know, having us care about each other. So I got a little sappy at this point. And, <laughs> uh, but I, I do think that, that the community is um, reflected in the plot and thus back onto us. Um, lastly, I did some criticisms, which, uh, which hurt me to do, but I knew that if I wanted to get honors, I had to do it. Um, and this is what I ended up with. Um, Atris is a male quest giver who is expectant of the players. Um, this is pretty typical of the time period and uh, I exemplify Super Mario uh, as an example because, you know, you play as Mario or you play as Luigi uh, in the original. And those are your only choices. And for many games of the time period, for many films of the time period, in my thesis, I talk about um, American Beauty um, and things like that. Um, the focus is always on a man and women are doing things for them usually and so uh, that's sort of lacking not that i don't love isha i do uh, but she doesn't come in until a, a lot later and like i said this this isn't necessarily a conscious choice nor is my next point but it was very common of games in the time period and i believe that it was symptomatic of uh, both the limitations of the creation of the game with such a small team and of its time period of creation we're also kind of lacking in racial diversity because the Denny appear human. Um, it's definitely on the whiter side. And the caveat to both of these things is that, you know, you are in the first person. So, you know, you can be yourself in any gender, in any skin tone, ability level, etc. as the stranger. Um, uh, Barring Uru, I guess, when you make your own avatar, but in uh, typical Mist fashion, and particularly Mist and Riven fashion, because those are the 1990s releases, you, you are allowed to immerse yourself, and that is the biggest strength of um, the first person point of view in, in a game. You can just be yourself, and you don't have to play another character, which a lot of people don't like to do. And last you have the legacy of Myst. Um, I feel like Myst has done something so unique and I am incredibly biased as a fan. They have done something so unique that it has uh, this gigantic lore, just absolutely intricate, beautiful. I, I, I liken it to Tolkien in some ways um, in that it's expansive and, you know, you can get specific questions answered because of the closeness of the community and et cetera like that, while still uh, allowing you to have a main plot, while allowing you to have options. And, you know, it continued throughout these themes for game after game after game, and maybe hopefully some more in the future. Um, and I really feel like it was the first game to, to do things like that. You also have Missed clone games, things like Corn, which are clearly, you know, spawned off of the ideas from Miss. Many puzzle games, uh, you know, smaller developers that I've talked to uh, pay homage to Mist in their games and uh, find themselves thinking about it. You even have Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch. Uh, we are not related to my knowledge. Uh, would love if we were, though. Gravity Falls is a great show. Um, he's even a huge fan of the show and honored Mist in the journal number three, a uh, published book. So goes to show you. Um, and Mist is also kind of this non-conventional time capsule for the 1990s um, with all of the different attitudes and the different things that it has um, preserved within it 
especially its original edition. I mean, you go back and you look at those those graphics and the water doesn't move. And I remember the water not moving when I first played. And now I play, you know, 25th anniversary edition and like, this is awesome. This is great. And so when you look back on the original, um, you can remember, you know, the technology and all of the notes of the plot that call back to the 90s. And of course, the emphasis on community that allows us to be here today. And I talked a little bit about what Mist um, means to me. Mist technically got me into college because my college essay was about Mist and got me out of college because my thesis was about Mist. So it's come really full circle. Eight-year-old me had no idea that I would be doing this. And the thought of it is still just absolutely mind-boggling, um, but I had a great time. I have, I believe this next page is my sickening amount of sources listed for you in case you were worried that I just um, grabbed from my bibliography. And uh, at this point, I wanted to open up for any questions that people might have about my research and writing process or about things that I found um, about the game and the community while I was doing so in the spring. Um, and that's when I think Capella has to come back. <laughs> yeah, Capella. I'm here. Hello. I actually have a question for you. Uh -huh. Spoilers to everybody else. The rest of you should start asking questions or this is going to turn into academia dialogue real fast. <laughs> Threatening. Uh, so I was thinking about what you were saying about how Ms. Uh, and the journals are really kind of a great example of old technology married with new technology. And I was thinking about the fact that in Mist and also in Ribbon, when we see journals, when we see paper journals, they tend to be people's innermost intimate thoughts. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, I mean, both Atris's journals will tell you about what Atris was thinking about any of the ages. And I'm thinking about, uh, you know, Gen's journal in, in Ribbon, especially his private bedroom journal. But we also see technologically mediated communication, which isn't journals. So that's things like uh, Atris's image or message. That's things like uh, Ben holograms, both in the temple and in, in his room, there's the one to Kita, which is the exception. But what, what do you think about, I guess, that intention, that when you're, when you're seeing the technologically mediated communication stuff, when you're seeing people talk through images or screens, it's not as intimate or personal as the journal. Do you think that's a, a conscious choice they're going for, that booths on paper are more heartfelt? I feel like the strongest difference between books in general in Mist and a slightly more technologically advanced communication is that the, to be colloquial, the books have range. Mm -hmm. You have a linking book, you have a journal book, you have a, a prison book, and all of these things are held within the same container and kind of forcing you to adventure where I feel like the um, hologram communications and, and et cetera are mostly existent to um, relay information to you in a very plain way and make sure that you're getting a specific point to um, aid your understanding of the plot and to help you move forward. Um, and I do like the inclusion of them because, you know, they're cool. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I certainly my don't think they're bad likes. things. I just, I thought it was like kind of interesting that in many of the hologram messages, you know, you've got Gen's pronouncement, you know, you've got his recordings in the schoolroom. You know, that's yeah. a little more ominous, a little more power laden, a little less intimate. But then there's that, that strong contrast with, you know, there's Keita's message to him in the imager. 
I feel like the sparseness of them in comparison to written word is is something that makes uh, the hologram messages really jarring as well. Um, I remember when I first got to, you know, Atrus's first message uh, in the underground uh, compartment in the original mist and Atrus's face was like on this like flat screen yeah. because 90s I was like whoa I wasn't expecting I wasn't expecting that here and then you you go on to to kind of see similar messages um in upgrading levels of depth uh throughout the game through Sirius and Akinar and then uh later Atrus at the end I guess spoilers later Atrus at the end <laughs> um and so it, it it's it's something something special, uh, just a little treat for uh, for you as as the player to continue rewarding progress. Oh, we've got a good one. Uh, are there is there any in game text which is not handwritten? That's that's an in world question, not a font question. Huh? Because I uh, think everything is people handwriting in their journals. Yeah, I don't believe that there's anything that even is, uh, like, indicated to be written by, like, a typewriter. I, I'm pretty sure all of the, all of the text is, is written um, by, by someone hand, someone's hand. Yeah. I apologize, by the way, if people are hearing my cat yelling in the background, she extremely wants my breakfast. I would say give it to her, but no, you also need breakfast. It's chocolate cake. No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. Um, someone points out that the, that the key exists in Uru, but we're, that's a 2003 game. And I think we're discussing Mist and Ribbon as the 90s games. Yeah, I, I definitely um, wanted to consider how the attitude of, like, the creators affected the creation of the later games. I am especially, a, I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion or if it's a popular opinion. I'm, like, a huge Revelation lover. Um, and, you know, I was trying really hard to think about it, especially when I was talking about technology and you have... Uh, you have to try moving the slider to connect a different signal and mm -hmm. um, all of uh, all of the things, the spider chair, uh, things that are there that uh, you wouldn't have seen in the original mist. Um, but I think that the the spirit and the style of it generally remains the same just with um, better uh, like graphic and coding um, ability. You know, that's that's actually a question too that I'm going to keep uh, keep asking is so obviously, especially writing in three months for Capstone Project, uh, you focused very much on the 1990s period. Would you ever, for fun, mm -hmm. go on and look at the 2000s? Oh, I uh, would... iterations of the game and contrast them culturally, especially because, as you pointed out so eloquently. Mist comes out of the 1990s kind of golden period where we've come out of several wars in the U.S. And then, of course, uh, the U.S. returns back to war in the 2000s. And through certainly, I mean, th there was some violence in Mist and Riven. Gen can shoot you. There's the implications of what Akinar has been up to. Yes, yeah. But the 2000s game has more explicit violence either done on you as the stranger in bad endings, if the Vidro beats your brain in. Uh, Uru has the treatment of the Baro as slaves. You know, and that's in a changing cultural context that survives 9-11 that deals with war. So, like, do you think you'd ever go back and do that just for fun? Or is it, no, I'm done with my thesis. I don't want to look at this again. I, I definitely had talked to my reviewers um, about extending this into a master's study, uh, in which case I would love to look at the 2000s. The reason I didn't is because... Um, there are very limited capstone options at my 2000 person uh, college and uh, 
1990s so happened to be what I signed up for and I didn't realize that I was going to write about mist until after I got there um and it just so happened to work out I could see my mist poster on my dorm wall behind me in our first zoom class and I went that's it um but yeah I I think there there are differences that that are integral especially with the borrow in end of ages um that I would love to address um I also do recognize that, you know, mist does, mist, violence does exist in mist. And my main point about it was that, um, I guess until the fifth game, you, you aren't the one enacting it as yeah. the stranger. You're witnessing it, but you, you never need it to help things move along. It's never the answer for you. I think that's a really great point and distinction to draw. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? I'm okay with being done if no one else has uh, any other questions. Thank you for entertaining me. I mean, like I said, I, as I as I threatened to everybody else, ooh, Kelly's got one. Kelly? You can speak. Come on. All right. I'll come out of hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Um, so regarding the trap books, uh, or, or, did you take a peek at Robin Miller's vinyl um, soundtrack that was released recently? I did not. Okay. Uh, I would I highly, I don't, I don't know if it's available anymore, but it was, it was a limited edition run, but uh, there's a bonus track on there that, that touches into some really fascinating headcanon stuff of where exactly were Cirrus and Akinar in the trap books and it's it's a different can it's a different theory than revelations because revelations is like oh yeah they were on spire and haven and by themselves and kind of you know lost their marbles but robin's original the theory uh or our headcanon or idea behind it was they were trapped in the void of of space in in the fissure Oh geez, yeah. I ended up not going with the vinyl because I don't have a record player. I don't have. Got it. Okay. I don't have anything to do with it. Um, <laughs> uh, somewhere, somebody. Oh, what is it called? Cap. Do you know the video I'm talking about? Somebody yes, did this, a. Somebody did a spectrographic analysis yes, of the recording. Spoilers uh, for those of you who haven't seen it. We'll link it in Discord. This is really kind of terrifying. Oh, it's terrifying. It is. So, when I, I didn't know what it was. It's essentially in. in in the audio, it or in the in the information about it, it's Atris goes over to a specific age and drops a microphone into the fissure. Like there's there's a there's an opening fissure there, and he drops the microphone in to try and understand what he would hear. You know, try and see what what was there. And uh, then it was like, oh yeah, here's the recording. But if you watch the 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 spe spectrograph, yeah. I don't know what it's called you the spectrograph. It off. The vinyl which someone did and then you put it through a spectrographic recording it was terrifying <laughs> um yeah are we gonna just spoil it i kind of want to spoil it but i'm not going to <laughs> that's up to that's up to you guys <laughs> i would there's... i would highly recommend having a, a shot of whiskey and then having a watch yeah there's... all right <laughs> I, I'm just going to spoil it, okay? okay? You watch the spectrographic analysis, and it's, you know, it's an analysis of, you wouldn't see it on the final aquafile because if you mm -hmm. just have the vinyl, you're listening to the audio. Yeah, and it just sounds like creepy weird, part. creepy, whatever. When someone copies off the audio and runs it through the spectrographic analysis, you know how it does, like, the, the waves? The yeah, down it's colored, like things? colored waves, yeah. There's a horrible little screeching noise. When you look at the spectrographic analysis, there's a face encoded and, in there. And writing. Help. Face and the writing. Yeah. That so it's it's Akinar, it's Akinar screaming into the void and then writing help in there. It's terrifying. And then they managed to take that wave and then compress it down into audio and then encode it onto the vinyl. And it is Terrifying. It's like, terrifying. <laughs> like I said, <laughs> have a shot of whiskey. I went watch. to Mysterium 2021 and all I got was this existential crisis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a quote book quote. We live there now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's just one of those those awful moments when, when you're thinking about communication. Uh, 
what what happens if the trap will guy what happens if you actually are falling into the void and you're literally miscorporating because you're breaking down from being a person into just being concept and it's it's very it's very scary it's yep. i recommend everyone watch this and have a brief moment of contemplating your place in the universe and if you actually exist <laughs> outside of being a concept in your own head and what happens yeah. to you when you link and does all of your concept travel through the link and then you decide maybe that you never actually want to link yeah mm -hmm. existence <laughs> several people are being like I think I'll take the revelations. <laughs> That's the mood. As um, a revelation lover in particular, I think I would take Haven over falling through nothingness uh, for an indiscriminate amount of time. Right. Haven, at least, there's there's yeah. life, there's critters, there's food, there's, you know, yeah. you maybe by yourself and losing your mind mentally, but like, there's at least, at least there are monkeys yeah. yeah there's monkeys there's like you know who are who are actually kind of intelligent and you so know we've got another couple questions uh one is did you ever get any pushback from your advisors on whether or not video games were an appropriate academic subject because for me when i did my undergraduate thesis on mist on Mystic Community and was also citing Celia Pierce. Uh, I got pushed back from my professor who said, I don't think video games and digital communities can be a thing because I was in a very traditional anthropology program where anthropology is situated in place, you know, in physical places. So I was lucky to have an advisor who said to me explicitly, I'm from the old school line of study where things are done in places, and I don't believe you that video game communities can be communities. So prove me wrong by writing this thesis, which I thought was hilarious. I uh, received but you did yours a lot later than mine. So did you did you get pushback, or were your professors excited about this? I I had no pushback about this, and I will tell you all why. Uh, my my second advising professor, who I talked very kindly of uh, at the beginning of this panel, Aaron Pedinati, uh, my first class with him was video games in American culture. So uh, obviously I knew that I was going to have him on my team when I decided mm -hmm. to do this. And I was a little worried that it wasn't going to count. My professor did set a boundary about people writing about music in terms of scholarship because she felt that she wasn't able to um, properly grade it, not that it wasn't important to the time period, um, but myself and one other person both wanted to write about video games, and she was very validating in this, and if anything, she gave me more sources that I didn't know about to complete my work. So, in 2021... Yay on video game thesis. <laughs> I think that's fantastic, though, like, honestly, that in in seven to eight years that things have been changing so dramatically. I am also very lucky. I'm in, you know, I went to a very small liberal arts school. My professors were both on the younger side um, and people who happen to like video games in their free time. And I'm sure if I was maybe in a different department or with uh, an older professor, it, it probably wouldn't have happened. Hooray for catching up with the times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. No, there's there's been I've I've heard studies done for um, video games, uh, like when when uh, folks who are elderly and maybe have dementia or something like that, like playing some video games is actually really good for your brain. And so there's there's being more studies done on like actually this is good for you. Like this is you know this is really okay. So yeah, I'm glad I'm glad they're um, they're being supportive. Yeah. Uh, another good question. What exactly was your major? I was an English major. Uh, got my degree in English, did not minor because I actually graduated in three years and I was busy uh, overloading on my major credits and fast tracking it. Um. <laughs> what, what is an English major for, for those of us who don't know? Me and the <laughs> uh, I, I, 
uh, my my base study or the things that I was required to study um, was kind of uh, the inner workings of literature itself. So I had to take introductory classes on um, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, uh, okay. learn about dissecting them. Uh, and then it kind of expands into um, other forms of media like um, like film, uh, in mm -hmm. my case, video games. And, um, you know, I did all sorts of things. You're required to do certain studies of things that are like early period at my school. So uh, mm -hmm. I took a Chaucer class, which was misery at its finest um, mm -hmm. for me. Um, I have no nice words to say to Mr. Chaucer. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I also got to learn about contemporary literature. And I took a class about um, post-war uh, literature in England and um, what that meant to, to them. So is overall uh, kind of an expansive uh, literature study and writing a study. I did um, a fair amount of creative writing and poetry workshops mm -hmm. in my time. Nice. Um, yeah, I did. I, I, I will say I inadvertently pretty much was an American studies major. I declared really early with the intention of graduating early. Uh, and I ended up taking the amount of classes needed to major in American studies is also uh, because of my interests there. Um, so I probably could have double majored if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> so another question we got, where do things like the Selenitic book fall in this comparison between technological and literary communication in the series? It seems like an interesting elaboration of books being a shell for multiple things versus technology being an impersonal broadcast. Because when you load it up in the rocket ship, there's a technological communications device, the screen, and you're interacting with it, you know, technologically to step on the book with the piano mm -hmm. and the power. But then it's actually a linking book. Yeah, I I think that that there are there are very clear links between um, other newer technologies and um, and the books and mist in general. I, I mean, it's obviously not a prehistoric world, and there are plenty of instances in which you are utilizing electrical power or things that are kind of unthinkable even to me, like the. Um, like the little underwater tram in Riven, that in itself is a pretty futuristic technology mm -hmm. uh, even today um, on its own scale. So, sorry, what was the specific book that they asked about? Uh, Solanidic. Oh yeah, the um, uh, rocket ship boy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that with Mist's um, reliance on the auditory, uh, which I know Rand talked about in Let's Play on Friday. Um, it was a, a great tie-in to another thing that is familiar to most people, a piano, right? Uh, yeah. It can be analog, and it was analog for a long time before the idea of a digital keyboard came around. And so it's tying in this very, this very simple thing, uh, and it's digitizing it to a certain um, certain. I can't think of the word that I'm trying to think of. It's digitizing it somewhat by placing it in the rocket ship, by connecting it to the power. Um, but it's outside of its uh, like normal usage in context. Um, obviously, if you're down screwing around with power breakers, um, you know, you're meant to be powering something, but you're not typically, um, you know, opening up doorways uh, with piano keys unless you are in the Goonies. Uh, <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Yeah. So you're, you're, you're combining a thing that is technically analog, you're putting it in a new place and um, eventually connecting it to, um, to a book as well. So I think that it's um, another uh, less prominent, but, but another infusion of the old with the new and the, the new within the game with another new within the game. Uh, if that checks out or makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've basically had time. So I've got one last question for you. Well, okay, I have one 
personal comment for you, which is we should clearly totally hang out and keep doing academic <laughs> chat uh, <laughs> in Discord because there's now a number of us with academia missed interests. So we should we should create a channel, cause chaos, keep talking about things. Two, I would ask you the question that I asked other scientists, do you have a pet? Yes, I do. Um, I think off. I think she is with my um, my parents right now who are watching the panel somewhere else in the house. Okay, that's fair. Um, you have to yeah. post a picture of your pet as a pet tax in the Discord. I will, I will post a picture of her. She is very cute, although she is in the cone of fame oh. right now. Oh, um, but, that was going to be my next question. Does she have feathers, fur, or I'm currently scales? trying to wrangle my own cat who is desperately yes. attempting to eat my breakfast. Yes, we we have a dog. We also have many fish around here. We yes. are fishful. Yeah. I, I I don't expect you to hold up the fish. That would be awkward. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> he's kind of chilling. They would be cranky. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming, everyone, and thank you for your questions and your interest. Oh, Billy. Sorry, I'm it's that time. It's cat. that time of the meeting where we get to meet the kids. <laughs> showing off my cat because she is absolute. This is Bailey. She likes yeah. bread, and Me she's too. doing her best to eat my breakfast, which is bread. Uh, <laughs> Max, thank you so much. It is, as I said, a pleasure to talk to you, and I really appreciate you putting everything out. Thank you.